That's an amazing part one. Talked about uh, a campus walked us through hell, walked us through heaven. But part two of this book, uh, Meditations on Death, is actually my favorite <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I, because I didn't expect it. And when I was when I was reading through this manuscript that you brilliantly translated. I got to this part, and I just wasn't expecting it, and I loved it. And it's entitled, A Discourse in the Person of a Sinner About to Die. So um, <clears throat> the, the author, Akempis, begins this chapter with a very interesting technique. He says, he says hey guys, there is a remedy to all temptation. <laughs> it's like any temptation you have. I know exactly how to handle it. <laughs> and then he starts be- talking about, now go into your private room and think about your day of death. So why don't you kind of yeah. tell us a little bit about how he begins this. Yes, yes, yes. So um, he recommends to us meditation on death as this powerful antidote to any kind of um, sin or temptation or, or worldly anxiety. He says, uh, asks us to imagine ourselves lying on our bed in the very throes of death. And how are we going to feel about it right then? And it suddenly makes whatever is tempting you to be much less appealing, doesn't it, Connor? <laughs> yes, and, it does. Um, and, and puts everything, everything that we're doing, which we're aspiring to do, you know, you would think if I'm struggling about something, if I'm ang- anxious about something, you know, at the moment of death, is it really going to matter all of that much? Yeah. Um, and then the choice between between good action or or uh, or wicked action or no action at all, and which one are you going to prefer when you come to that final point? So it's keeping the end always in mind, and um, and I think he's quite right in saying that this is a universal remedy for all of our um, moral uncertainties and everything, all of our temptations. So I tell you, Father, you know, we have a joke sometimes. My brothers and I will. You know, if we say like, oh, how, you know, how's your day going? And one of my goofy brothers, he'll say, terrible, terrible. I said, what's wrong? He'll say, my, my toaster doesn't have a bagel setting. <laughs> it's <laughs> something, something completely ridiculous to just yeah. so, you know, but, but, you know, we, we, we stress over the stupidest things. Oh, we do. You we know, do. and, you know, my, uh, m- one of my teenagers wrecked one of my cars again. Um, very recently, this is when you have 15 children and they become teenagers. You become, you know, a plague to oh, well. car insurance companies. I see. Yeah. As, as a mug, I think this is something which I'm a little bit grateful I've escaped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am, um, I am struggling through that. But we're always, therefore, forced to look at, okay, what other car are we going to get? You know, like we keep adding drivers, so we have yep. to get other cars. And... So anyway, so I'm looking at a car, and a, a nicer car than I'm used to looking at. I was looking at something. And then I find myself saying, ooh, look at this. This car has doesn't just have heater in the seats, but it has an air conditioning seat. And like, <clears throat> so you can click the button, and the seat's air conditioned. And I'm like, that's nice. Ooh, look at this. The, the steering wheel has a heater built into it. Wow, this is really nice. And I start looking at it. And so then we're comparing one car to the other. And I find myself just so quickly, because I've always just drive, you know, clunkers, cars. And I'm, but I'm looking at it now saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am sitting here slightly stressing over whether my steering wheel has a heater in it and whether my my seat has an air condition built into it. like this is completely ridiculous you know so i got control of myself very quickly i'm not a car person at all but my point is is as silly as that is or as silly as whether your toaster has a bagel setting on it you know or how good your blender is you know for your smoothie or something stupid i think on our deathbed father we're going to see all the all the issues of this life, you know, our reputation, how much money we made, you know, our education, all of these kind of big things we're going to see as silly as the heater in the steering wheel and as silly as the air conditioning in the seats and as silly as whether your toaster has a bagel setting. That's right. And, and that's something that this, when we go on to the discourse in the person of the sitter about to die, you know, it doesn't say he's like a, a huge sinner. It doesn't specifically name any of his sins or anything. So presumably he's no, you know, no worse than, than we're all sinners in some way or the other. Um, 
but he reflects that he's wasted so much of his life, all these precious opportunities um, in the pursuit of vanities, in fleeting shadows and worldly things, um, things which don't matter. And I think, you know, if we reflect on our own lives, often we can find that, yeah, where our thoughts are occupied, our time and energy are expended on things which aren't really going to matter all that much. Yeah. 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 So in this, uh, he begins, he, he goes from saying, okay, lay on your bed or, or imagine yourself laying on your deathbed. And then he's, and then he starts talking about death, like capital D, like death in a character. Like, yeah. You know, shows up and stands next to the bed and there's a line here on page 36 he says and here i hear the grim voice of death calling to me sinister thunderous and with a hollow spectral resonance and drawing ever more nigh it says this is death death says you are mine now Neither your wealth, nor your honors, nor your reason, nor your knowledge, nor your wisdom, nor your friends, nor your kin are able to free you from my clutches. Arise and let us depart now from the land of the living. I mean, this gives you goosebumps, you know? I mean, this it, is serious it, business. It, it and does, this is a Kempis in the year 1400 something yeah, yeah. being extremely imaginative. Indeed. Uh, for very practical reasons. Yeah, yeah. And. Um, this, uh, interestingly enough, was about the time when the personification of death as as the Grim Reaper Grim really Reaper, came yeah. into uh, into circulation, into currency at this point in t- in history, and you know the idea of of death coming, arriving at us as a kind of unwelcome guest one day, and compelling us to accompany him, I think is very um, very sobering thought, and realizing that we're going to have to leave behind our wealth, our status. Everything which often we work so hard in this life to acquire, and what do we take with us? We take with us the record of our deeds, both good and bad. A very sobering thought indeed. Do you guys have uh, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol over there in Australia? Oh, uh, yeah, we do. Okay, we do. okay I yeah, it. I mean... I mean, he, that's one of the, probably the most famous Christmas story there is, and it's that's the idea, right? I mean, it's this 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 man, you know, encountering the horrors of of death and having to think about what his life was made of, yeah. and it, it leads to a great conversion. That was the whole story, right? And so, Akempis is doing this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what six hundred years ago? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's amazing. So. Tell us um, <clears throat> the next chapter, A Lament Over Time Wasted. So just talk to us. Now, he's really now full-blown into the story of this man who's right at death's doorstep. And yeah. he's thinking now about what did he spend his time yeah, doing. Yes, and he talks about this and he says, um, How foolishly and profitless did I let my life pass by, wasting it neglectfully, and carefully, carelessly, as it were, a thing of no value, or as if it were endless in scope and would never run out. I squandered my time like an irresponsible spendthrift squanders money, not considering for a moment that it was both precious and limited. So this is so important, you know, because wasting time is actually, if you think about it, wasting life, because what is mortal life but a certain quantity of time, time. that we're given? Yeah. You know, and and people waste their li- waste their time quite casually, either on um, on pointless things or doing nothing or doing things which which have got no productive goal. I think it it really calls to mind how precious a gift this time is because it's our one chance. We're not going to get a second chance. No, I'm not talking about purgatory, of course, but but you know, this is our one chance of of expressing God's love and grace of fulfilling his will, of becoming the people who God wants us to be. And, and you know, we can see how much time these days is spent surfing the internet or phones or whatever. And, yeah. yeah. And he talks about um, his reflection on life, and he says, um, All of these things have vanished, like an insubstantial shadow passing in the night, or like a courier or herald who runs by swiftly without pausing to linger or like a ship hastening through the waves which leaves not a trace of pacing, or like a bird flying through the air which is quickly gone and leaves no footprint in in its flight, or like the sound of a bell ringing out which once it has ceased to toll leaves no lasting impression or memory. This is amazing how transient things are and 
depending upon how old you are, you know, you look back and you realize not only does life pass by quickly, but it seems to pass by at an accelerating rate, yeah. you know. Yeah. When you're young, every year seems to go on forever. And then after a few years, they go by quicker and quicker. And then you reach a point and you think, gee, the last decade has passed me by pretty quickly. So I wrote about that in one of my previous books. And I've, I've, I've thought and actually studied on that that notion of why does time feel to feel that it goes by faster and faster. And I think it's because <clears throat> young, and this is speculation on my part, father, but young children live in the present moment. They're very happy. They're not thinking about yesterday. And they're also not worried about their retirement plans. They're not worried about their 401k. They're not worried about fundraising. They're not worried about making money. They're just living in the present moment. God is the eternal now. He lives in the eternal now, right? I mean, he's, he's not in the past. He's not in the future. He's just the eternal now. And our present moment is the closest we ever get to God in the eternal now. So I think the way, I think there's actually a technique that you and I can use to make time slow down. Yeah. And that is to not <clears throat> have resentments of the past, um, not live too much in our memory of nostalgia or regrets, and also not to have too much worry, anxiety, concern about the future, but to embrace the present moment, which is the only place that God really is in our life, is in the present moment, at least on the time spectrum. And I believe if we do that, then time stops moving as quickly. We become childlike, just as he said, you must be like these little ones to enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's just a reflection I've had. Of, that's why time goes by so quickly is because we're not living in the present moment. We're stuck in the past and we're stuck in the future, which is exactly where the devil wants us. Yeah. 